to everyone. Uh, uh, for some of you, it might be a return to the website and to what we're offering at um, Hopkins at home. And um, if it's not, then I should just say that uh, I do not assume necessarily that you've seen the previous talk. When I mean seen, uh, there is a PowerPoint attached to it, and it's quite important because it serves as a kind of anchoring points for what I'm presenting. And one of the things that I said last time already was that I tend to work in a, in a spiral. Um, that is, I pick up a topic and put it on the table, so to speak, as an important idea or an idea that I would like to dig into. And I have made every effort today to come back to some of the things we did last time. But what I hope to do above all is to uh, bring you back in a space that um, we ended up in last time, which was a space that I thought raised important questions, as I would say to my students, big questions with capital B and capital Q, big questions that have to do with um, the range of action and the freedom that uh, a writer can experience when that writer happens to be a woman and when she lives at the time that is that of Jane Austen. So range of action and freedom. And then um, because that's directly related to our title, how in a mode of confinement, which is, I'll explain that, typically a mode of existence for many women, uh, in the 19th century, certainly the woman, Jane Austen, with the kind of familial and economic background that was hers. So we are looking at a moment when confinement is a, an interesting notion when you look at a woman writer like her. And yet that raises the question, how did she manage to become famous and how did she manage to become a literary genius really, which is part of my argument today. I'm gonna to try and show you why I think she's an absolute genius and persuasion because it's her last work um, that came to full fruition. The one that she cared about most and the one that she revised very carefully, persuasion is a moment of Austin's literary career that could have gone on for much longer, but that was interrupted, where we happen to have very precise documentation about how she works. And that is how I set up my first slide. I set up my first slide with an example of the corrections she made to her book. And the most important corrections were actually the corrections that she did to the ending. And that question of the ending, I announced today, is for next time, lecture three, we'll be talking about denouement, so we'll come back to the precise nature of the ending. But today, I'm using a much broader brush. The broader brush that I'm using, for example, leads me to say to you that there is um, a particular poignancy to this book, Persuasion, that I want you to be aware of from the start. Uh, that poignancy has to do with the fact that uh, this was a book that was written in the shadow of illness. And it's a book that is in some ways encrypted with notions of death and love. And I think that's why it's the most romantic novel of hers. We talked about it a bit last time in Question Time also, how melancholy and sad this novel of Second Chances is. Well, here we have at the outset something I want you to be aware of, which is this is the book written when she was herself ailing, Jane Austen was, and she knew that she might not be able to go on for much later. And this is in a way among her most luminous books but it's also infiltrated, so to speak, by a dimension of sickness that is embedded in the book. And that's why I thought it would be so interesting, in fact, to propose to you as a kind of anchoring point, uh, the episode of Mrs. Smith. Yeah. And that's going to be yeah. for our question time. And hopefully already we launch the discussion as I get to the end of my lecture. So, as I move 
into a presentation of uh, persuasion written in 1818. I am well aware, in fact, of the, the modernity of this book, um, but also very interested in the title of the book, Persuasion. And um, the critic I mentioned last time, Tony Tanner, who doesn't have the electronic resources we have to do for the search per function, has noticed the persistent presence of the word uh, persuasion in the book. And it's all the more interesting to hear that about that discovery, that it turns out that the title of the book Persuasion is one that was ascribed after Austin's death by her literary executors, by her sister Cass and by her brother Henry. It was chosen instead of the Elliots. And we have to say, you would agree with me, wouldn't you, that the Persuasion is a much better title. And if you wanted any evidence for that, you would want to look again more closely, perhaps, at the page I offered as extra reading, which is the sum total, so to speak, of what Persuasion is about, but held together in the most compressed of manners. And if you remember, uh, from the previous slide, I quoted what is already, you could say, almost the kind of advertising for the book that was produced by the author herself. It could be, you know, put on those paper uh, wrappers that are on famous books on tables. She had been forced into prudence in her youth. She learned romance as she grew older, the natural sequel of an unnatural beginning. She had been forced into prudence in her youth. She learned romance as she grew older, the natural sequel of an unnatural beginning. This has you know, a poetic quality to it, which you hear when you read it out loud, but it is also really almost like an advertising uh, phrase for her book. So, Persuasion, a book that is the book of a woman at the top of her powers, at the top of her powers with ambitions that are interesting in terms of the art of persuasion she uses for her book. And you may remember from school days or from readings, or maybe you've not been part of a culture where this was still taught, but the art of persuasion is what you used to call rhetoric. And rhetoric is the secret here. The rhetorical tricks that Austin plays on us are going to inform her novel and inform our experience on the no of the novel in ways that are fascinating. Last time we, we, we talked about how we were captivated by the novel. This time, I want you to think about how we have actually, we are moved and we're instructed by this novel. Moved and instructed, but also perhaps um, pleased in a strange way. And in that old rhetoric, um, there were three words that were used to describe how you produced a poem or narrative that would create emotion and persuasion in your readers. Well, there was placere, movere, and docere. Docere is to instruct, movere is to move, and placere means to please, but it also means to appease. So I am thinking of us as listeners and readers, listeners to and readers of uh, Jane Austen, and I see to what degree perhaps this book that she wrote under confinement might be one that uh, has something to teach us that is not only about morality, but about some kind of acceptance of difficult constraining circumstances that are ours now as we confine to home, many of us, and as uh, there is an echo chamber between what Austin was offering in her literary work and what we are trying to understand, namely Jane Austen for our times. I want to remind you not because of, you know, I'm intent on 
keeping a philosopher in the picture, but just because it was something that we explored a little quickly last time, perhaps, I want to remind you that we are reading this book also in the context of somebody who explained that at about the time of Jane Austen, there was an explosion of speech aimed at persuading others. Uh, you may remember that phrase from the course description, but I tried to unpack it a bit more. And as I did that, I was actually also just um, committing to something that we don't always like to do in literary studies, which is to say, is there a message in her book? What kind of a message might there be in her book? I'm, I'm leaving that as a question mark because that's to a large degree what my mission is today. My mission today is to say that in the course of offering a kind of moral topography for her world, the world in which she lived, Austin enables us also to recognize that as an author of the late 18th, early 19th century, she has things to offer. And she has things to offer thanks to what you could call um, her energy. And here I, you know, I'm citing the biographer, Tomaline, who says that there is in her later books, an energy, a wit, a self-confidence, and the ability to think for herself, which is interesting. Her heroine is learning to think for herself, Anne Elliot, but Austin is in fact in a place where she can now think for herself at a time, historically, of disarray, of loss of authority in what was, not only her place as a woman of her time, but also much more broadly in a place of disarray and loss of authority in the social and political spheres. And uh, what's um, interesting about the novel in the end, that is, is that as the critic Tony Tanner tells us, that she manages to create inside the novel a true love that is so certain of itself that it becomes self-authorizing. A true love so certain of itself that it becomes self-authorizing. I read the sentence emphatically because it's rich. It's a very strong proposition about the novel, but it's all the more interesting that it actually says that in the process of writing the novel, Jane Austen was brought back to the idea of a romantic spirit, of a true love, of a love that she is able and capable of imagining in her book, and a love that is very different from what we envisage in the much more uh, happier mood of Pride and Prejudice when we talked a little bit about the novel last time. And you may have seen that I offered you some um, prized pages actually from uh, Pride and Prejudice to take another look at what I meant. But uh, Austin is aware of her tools, she's aware of her genius, and um, part of the evidence we have for that is not evidence that's outside of her books, it's actually inside her books. And that evidence uh, tells us hmm, that the question of why you would want to read a novel hmm, is uh, a question that's very much in the air. It is one that is critical. It is one that says women, um, novels corrupt. Uh, novels should not be read too often by women. Novels uh, charm us and provide escape, but novels are not serious. And Jane Austen encrypted in North Anger Abbey, a famous praise of the novel that is cited very often by people in my profession because it's one of the wittiest, the cleverest of descriptions of how you come to the defense of the novel, which is how you come to the defense of what you do. If you look at the bottom of the slide here, you, I want you to note that just as I was uh, two days ago preparing the lecture, I received a message from the Morgan Library in New York that is putting online in the absence of exhibit uh, in the Morgan Library itself, is putting online 
elements towards an exhibit that is called A Woman's Wit, Jane Austen's Life and Legacy. Uh, Jane Austen is famous. And that is something that we need to be aware of as part of her literary genius. There are not many uh, figures in modern literature uh, that have managed to have the double standing of being both classics to the degree that uh, they belong to a tradition that's very much an academic tradition, but also at the same time, something we talked about that I showed you last time in my lecture, an author who is popular, who has been popularized, popularized, who has been made into movies, who has become, uh, you know, figures on, on mugs, who, where people passionately and with devotion sometimes also read her every word because there is in her something that transcends all periods and all genres, and that just brings us to a place where we think when we read Jane Austen, we're learning something. And yet, one has to be aware of the fact that when Jane Austen writes that praise of the novel, when she commits to the novel, she's taking tremendous risks. She's taking risks uh, in terms of putting shall I call it like this, putting all her eggs in the same basket, in that domestic metaphor. She's, she put her everything in the belief that if she had the discipline to write, and if she trusted herself enough to be capable of it, even in restricted circumstances, she was going to be leaving behind a legacy uh, that was central to uh, the dispensations of modern culture. And I insist that this is modern. It's all the more modern that Jane Austen is already aware of something that was studied later by critics and pinpointed especially in that wave uh, of feminist criticism about the novel, namely the way in which she traded off a book for a child. She describes the birth, the creation of a book, in the terms of the birth and creation of a child. She knows what she sacrificed. But what she might be sacrificing also is, of course, her reputation. Uh, you may recall from last time the quote, the mention that was made about uh, a woman writer being nothing more than a rope dance dancer, taking risks in a high wire act. And if she falls, she's derided, but also putting herself really up as a kind of spectacle. There is a whole culture, in fact, on sport of deriding women writers as being too serious, as being too passionate, as being too involved with their own works to actually even uh, take care of themselves. You may have heard of blue stockings. And if you want to hear about blue stockings or les bas bleus, because the image traveled across the channel, I'll be happy to talk about it uh, in question time. However, what's most important to mention here at the end of this investigation of why uh, the praise of the novel is such an important item, is to go back to one other element that was made uh, visible when we looked at Habermas, the philosopher, namely his acute perception of the fact that there came a time, there came a moment when women could actually come into the limelight with their professions as writers. And this leads me to my next slide here, Jane Austen, as my title says here, availed herself of a new opportunity that was made available in the modern age, namely a place or a space where, as a woman, you can talk freely and persuade. And that's in literature. That is by being a woman of letters. Uh, there has been, uh, on the far right of that slide, you see pictures of Simone de Beauvoir. There's been a lot of discussion recently because new texts have been translated about Simone de Beauvoir, the author of The Second Sex, 1949. Simone de Beauvoir, in a way, gives me the language to describe what my topic is when I look at Jane Austen's confinement and the amazing success of her 
production and of her labor. One has to imagine that this writer is somebody who was a woman of middle class condition, of a world where she was in between a, the privileges and the protections of a more gentle and a more aristocratic existence. For example, there were still servants in her household. And then on the other hand, a place where she had to find a position in her writing that would speak up, that could speak up about what her experiences as a woman were in that transition period of the Enlightenment towards the 19th century, the more modern moment. And one of the things I, I want to put on the table for us is this idea that her novels are not only about women, they are really about la condition humaine, the human condition in general. I don't want us to have a biased reading of persuasion and not pay attention to Wentworth. However, the viewpoint, the dimension of what she's capable of doing in her art is determined by the circumstances, by the situation that is that of her as, her, as a woman. And situation is an other word that we owe to existentialism. Virginia Woolf, in a way, is just as important. She is uh, the ghost, so to speak, the ghostly presence in today's talk. I would not be talking about writing as a profession, about the challenges of converting a difficult existential situation into a great literary work if I hadn't studied very closely Virginia Woolf. And uh, Virginia Woolf could also inspire a conversation about the benefits of on being ill. After all, I have said it already, Jane Austen was ill, her heroine, Anne Elliot, the melancholy character is arguably ill, something we can develop today, but we'll return to next time. And it's very clear to me that we have in that lineup, in that lineage of women, everything we need to see in order to place Austen in a great literary tradition represented exquisitely masterfully and with such talent by women. And last time um, we had a question about Charlotte Bronte, Jane Eyre, here is Charlotte Bronte. Um, Charlotte Bronte is one of the major voices, in fact, of that examination of the woman's condition, of a woman's situation. And one of the things I, I learned when studying the novel was how much in the novel is actually about situations that can be very concrete. It's Lukács who actually says to us that if you want to know everything that Marx taught us about money, all you need to do is read the novel in the 19th century. Well, money, making money, how much money can you earn by being a writer happen to be part of the tremendous challenge uh, and the tremendous daring of Jane Austen when she decided to become a professional writer. Now, my next slide is one uh, that will be familiar. I, it is actually one that I want to dwell on as well. Uh, I will do so in ways uh, that I hope are meaningful because I'm looking at this slide as a kind of hub for the important themes that I would like to convey to you today. So the hub for those important themes involves a return, partly, to images we saw last time. Uh, I used as an anchoring point, but also as a teasing uh, a reference to uh, Austin's educational value, the way in which she teaches us. You remember I, talk, I talked about docere, teaching. She teaches us with these emblematic images that, in this case, I took up 
from a, a book on Pride and Prejudice. And here is the freedom, the, the, the ability to choose, to move, to have a kind of almost erotic energy that we saw in the love of dance as well. Um, in the picture as a reminder of what we saw last time. But let's turn it around a little bit. What this picture of that physical mobility suggests to me are essential tokens, in fact, of that vocabulary that has to do with what kind of an existence can a woman aim for or aspire to? And existence, some of you who did some philosophy or some of you who've been maybe uh, dragged into reading a little bit of Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, existence, existentialism is what we're talking about. That is, we're talking about the possibility of freedom, of choice, of a recognition that the modern subject, the modern woman as well, is given in her own constrained, straightened circumstances somewhat, sometimes, the ability to actually transcend what her world is, to do something else. And I didn't say it enough when I talked about the slide with my four women. I didn't talk about how educated they all were. Jane Austen was educated enough to be able to work with a minimum of information. And in fact, she probably read much more than we're able to retrace. But she was able to work with a minimum of information with little schooling. She stopped school at 10, after all, to build a world of such stature huh, that she belongs to a world history of literature, partly because she wrote in English and partly because, as I was, have been arguing, the, her themes about the human conditions are really global. So on this slide, you have the contrast, so to speak, between a life that we know historically to have been a life of little travel. There was something very insular about Jane Austen. And then on the other hand, a vision, which I offer on the slide on the right, which you already saw last time as well, of a certain mobility. People are beginning to travel. Uh, there are coaches. Uh, there are places that take you around. And people move sometimes in such coaches. You actually see images on television these days of poorer nations where everyone's possession is on a coach of this kind. But one of the great elements here, I think, of uh, anchoring our understanding of Austin in her place, in her space, and in her time, is to, of course, understand that uh, we were, we, in 19th century Britain, at the beginning or of, the of the 19th century, forgive me, at the beginning of the 19th century, you were in a culture that was geared up for mobility. There wasn't only industrialism, but there was always, also, always a chance to start moving around and to do not only grand tours abroad and to go to on the continent and to discover new countries, which was a thing that many young men, contemporaries of Austin and of her class would have done. So you couldn't, you, you weren't only invited to travel the big wide world, but you could travel locally. And as you probably remember from your history classes, the railroad was settled, established, built in England before it ever came to across the channel to France. So mobility is part of the picture, but that mobility is something that um, is restrained and restricted for a woman, partly because she doesn't have the freedom of those adventures. And um, what we know, in fact, is that if anything, um, Jane Austen was constrained to uh, work in places that put her in between. Um, I'm quoting here from a text that we owe to what I believe is her great niece, Caroline. Um, that text, which is in a late slide so that you can look at it again, 
says the following about Jane Austen, who was observed by Caroline as she was um, engaging in her profession as a writer. She was careful that her occupation should not be suspected by servants or visitors or any persons beyond her own family party. She wrote upon small sheets of paper, which could easily be put away or covered with a piece of blotting paper. There was, between the front door and the offices, a swing door which creaked when it was opened. But she objected to having this little inconvenience re remedied because it gave her notice when everyone, when anyone was coming, because it gave her notice when anyone was coming. Notice why? Why does she want notice? Maybe because she wants her activity to remain discreet. Maybe because she wants to be polite, available to welcome an unexpected visitor into that parlor where she's somehow um, hidden or placed herself, that space, the parlor, because it would be warmer than the bedroom that she shared with her sister. Maybe hmm, notice because um, somebody might have pointed out, well, what's this woman doing? Uh, you know, using precious pieces of paper to scribble when in fact she should be visiting others and taking care of members of her community, which by the way, Jane Austen did very, very generously and very zealously. But, um, but the life of somebody like Jane Austen was in fact measured uh, between uh, very carefully in teaspoons almost, between a ratio of pleasure, leisure, and obligation. And in fact, my sense is that the pleasure, the leisure, which we don't have many traces of, must have been there when she was young. That's why she was described as being so vivacious. And that's why she's described sometimes as resembling Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice. So there was a moment of pleasure and leisure but there was also a moment of increasing obligations and constraints. So I ask you to imagine here that um, somehow the space that we discover with Jane Austen is that of a kind of, of hub, uh, a hub where she can observe, where her activities converge, where her papers are, and where if all goes well, she will have a manuscript ready at some point that will be the creation in that space of how she saw the world. Now, one has to remember that essential to her profession, crucial, of course, is paper. And that in all those travels, one of the great anxieties that Jane Austen must have experienced, we think did experience, was that of losing her precious pieces of paper, losing her manuscript. She was shuttled around the country, no, not a vast country, up to London at times, uh, down to uh, um, Winchester when she became more sick. Uh, she was never able to have an office that would have been her place for her professional life. And she adjusted the best way she could and found shelter the best way she could. For example, we wouldn't have Sense and Sensibility if she hadn't been inv invited to, to London by her cousin. But with all of that, there comes a kind of mobility and instability that makes one wonder how she was able to rescue so much from that life and how she was able to convert, uh, you know, what was a difficult confinement at times with so many interruptions, how she was able to convert that into that work of genius that I have argued is persuasion. So here I, I zoom in, so to speak, on um, that inner space hmm, that is that of um, women and their absorption in a world that is a world of new communications that are enabled when a coach comes in 
and carries not only people and possessions, but also carries possibly a piece of paper called a letter. And we take this so much for granted, but imagine a world, hmm? imagine that world when uh, being a woman in her position meant among other things, uh, relating to friends, yes, when they were close in conversations, but otherwise through letters, prized letters that sometimes would take a long time or prized letters that luckily she was in England, were not too expensive, but were still a concern. The paper was expensive as well. But that thing that is being held in the hands of these two women, neither of them is Jane Austen, uh, that thing for me is almost emblematic for that inner space that a woman of letters is inhabiting, uh, starting from the moment when women became more literate. Uh, you recognize on the left, perhaps, huh? in fact, the labeling tells you <laughs> uh, a detail from a picture, a painting by Vermeer. On the right, a lovely, lovely uh, uh, pastel by a compatriot of mine, <laughs> Lyotard. And um, I mention him because he was among the most talented portraitists of his age. And one of the things that he did was to pay particular attention, in fact, to, to women uh, as uh, they were engaged in activities that he felt were part of their position as daughters, particularly, or as future brides within families. And uh, here is a portrait of Mademoiselle, uh, uh, whose name I have forgotten, <laughs> who is reading a letter, both lovely images. And I want you to have them in mind, so to speak, as, as you're continuing to read Jane Austen and especially Persuasion. Now, here is a shorthand to help you visualize what it might, meant in the, at the time that was that of uh, Jane Austen to be dependent on communication. It meant having, well, having another fountain pen or a computer. Uh, you, had, you had a quill. You had a knife to uh, try and, and sharpen your quill. And you had pieces of paper that were precious that got folded into them into small pieces. And I love on this slide, actually, I love uh, the, the folding as well. And that in the 17th century already, they must have been in homes, a board like this one, where you actually collected all your emails, so to speak, where you held together the business letters with their seals and the private letters with their seals open and a, a flourish of address that is probably not business, but private. Your private and public mail was on a board so that you could pick it up easily and you could continue writing. And I would like to imagine that at least half of this board uh, is the board of someone who is like the characters in Jane Austen's fiction, like the characters in Jane Austen's fiction, waiting eagerly for letters. Jane Fairfax in Emma, that we'll be reading soon. The importance given to a crucial letter at the end of persuasion. All of this, I think, is a powerful reminder of uh, a, a space of communication and women of letters, in the, with a pun on the word, that is actually encrypted, so to speak, in her book. And yet, at the same time, at the same time, you're looking at history with a capital H. <laughs> uh, and uh, here, uh, two paintings that uh, seem important to me. The two paintings are of the Battle of Trafalgar on one side, and on the other hand, a painting of Bonaparte, uh, the little general, as he used to be called. Um, a reminder, and this is not the place to dwell for too long in history, but just a mention here of uh, the amazing moment in which, uh, in history, in which we, we are placing uh, the life of somebody like Jane Austen, a moment uh, of uh, Franco 
Anglo wars, a moment of uh, terrible loss of life, a moment of tremendous heroism and, and brutality, and a moment, of course, that was not only something she would read about uh, in uh, the press that was available to her, but a moment that involved her two brothers. Austin had two brothers in the Navy, Francis, who sailed to the East Indies in a aptly called ship, uh, there must be a different name, probably a frigate of some kind, called Perseverance. So Francis sailed to the East and Indies um, in, a, in a frigate, uh, rose in the ranks, and in fact, I like to believe, inspired the figure of Wentworth in the novel. In fact, he is the one who succeeded to the extent that until the crash uh, that affected the whole family, he made money as a sailor, think went worse again. And then the other one, the younger brother, the darling of the family, Charles, who studied at the Naval Academy and who was the unlucky one who ended up dying, in fact, in his, uh, in, uh, in, in his yellow fever, uh, in one of his unfortunate postings uh, far away in the Navy. So Jane Austen is often criticized for the narrow focus of her novels. In, in a kind of vein of uh, discussions about uh, novels of her time, about realism and history. But in fact, what's amazing is how much history she managed to put in her, in her books. And she put that history in her books indirectly, so to speak, by creating characters and figures and not by giving us uh, uh, narratives of heroic battles, even though one sees late in the novel when men get together, when they're in Lyme Regis particularly, one gets glimpses of conversations that these men must have been having, sailors, admirals, uh, captains, uh, like Captain Harvey, for example, about the adventures that they shared when they were posted somewhere far away. Uh, in that empire on which the sun never sets to wage wars. But, um, but that's all the backdrop, so to speak, of a novel that, as you know, because you, I hope, started reading it, begins with an amazing scene uh, which shows a dying breed, huh? a dying breed that is of uh, noblemen and gentlemen, gentlemen like Darcy, for example, in uh, Pride and Prejudice, noblemen who still have a title, but noblemen who uh, try to hang on to their title, hmm? Sir Walter Elliot of Kellynch Hall, on the move and uh, so retrenched economically that they actually have to rent out their property. And I will show you a series of slides here that are a way of summarizing the moment in history in which Jane Austen uh, has anchored her novel and that show you indirectly in those images how she transformed the narratives we have of that world into scenes, very precise descriptions that have to do with a changing world where prestige and money were jousting for each other and where the whole question of social mobility became so important and more than that the question of authority as well became became actually a question uh, that uh, is spelled out for us by Tony Tanner when Tony Tanner announces very smartly that the question of the turbulences of the war, of the economic challenges of a costly war, of the losses that came with the war, of the uh, turmoils in the financial markets as modern capitalism became more and more present. All of those uh, elements in that are bundled up, so to speak, in the um, experience uh, of uh, a history that is a social and an economic history, all these elements hmm, are reflected in Jane Austen's novel indirectly, but very powerfully when she uh, has us uh, enter not only into the world of sensibility of her heroines, 
but also when she actually shows us uh, glimpses of the world that they inhabit. So for example, you have here uh, a famous picture of the, the Prince Regent, and I chose it uh, because <laughs> Jane Austen actually scorned this man. She scorned him, uh, but she was very awkwardly positioned because she was asked to actually dedicate her novel, Emma, to the Regent. And what we know about the Regent is that at the time when the country was already under considerable duress, well, he was throwing large parties, uh, one of them costing as much as 120,000 pounds when the war had been, when the nation had been at war for 20 years, and uh, that he even forgot to invite his own wife to the party, uh, which made me think that uh, at some level, um, when we're thinking of Jane Austen for our times, um, that um, there, there is a kind of rubric we should have of history repeating itself. Uh, that, that the area of great spending that we, we've been part of um, is also an area that matches in Austin's time, but also in her time, a kind of social, and moral, and political confusion uh, that is a crucial element of now, as it is an element of that world of the past. And, you know, it might be for that reason, in fact, that we are so eager to read Austin for what she is to teach us, because she offers us here some kind of moral topography. When, in fact, hmm, being a woman writer and being feminine, perhaps in her style, one imagines that what she's best at is describing uh, things like this, what women wore, uh, the kind of dancing that occurred, the kinds of accessories that went with this favorite activity of hers, but also an activity that was so much part of the culture of pleasure and leisure, namely the dancing, that, the dancing that happened in, in, in Bath, the dancing that happened in London, it's all the same, and it's all part of a world that is not frivolous. It's a world that can be very formal, that can be very ruled, as we saw last time, but it is a world that is intent on making the most of the entertainment that is available to her. Uh, now here, um, you have another view hmm, of uh, a world that is Jane Austen's world, as described, and I just want to point here at the slide that is on the left for us, which is a slide that shows us a lady who um, is being greeted by a gentleman while reclining in that armchair. Uh, you obviously have a candidate for somebody who may have eaten far too much, we think, uh, or who may suffer from some kind of a condition, but who nevertheless for the time would have been emblematic for somebody suffering from gout. And the theme of illness hmm, gradually seeps into our text as we recognize that behind the facade of these homes, there are in fact uh, elements of a culture that um, I know for having taught not so long ago, Death in Venice by, um, by Thomas Mann, a culture where when you visit spas, uh, you are in fact um, bringing money, capital, um, entertainment to a city where at the same time on the other side of the fence, you have the poor who do their best to actually get a little bit of money for a pittance or who hope that perhaps by um, playing a little bit of music, uh, they might also get some money thrown into that hat. And it's amazing to me to think that in that picture, one could almost already see, um, if you're familiar with it, Death in Venice, where if you remember, we're talking about a life uh, in a city that is undergoing an epidemic of cholera. Here you have life in a city that is devoted to taking care to some who are seriously ill and for whom the spa might be the last 
recourse for getting treatment and others who are there for the entertainment, for the option and the possibility of, act, of social mobility even, since it's possible to go to balls to dances and in that free space to meet other people and new people. So here, the reminders huh, of a world where people are on ships and waging wars, reminders of the prestige that must have been attached to the uniform of figures like Wentworth, or rather Austin's brothers, perhaps, which must have inspired her. But above all here, figures that now take us to a shift of tone where we're no longer in that romance and excitement that we saw last time of uh, ladies being carried by gentlemen uh, in ways that suggest that they're enraptured by uh, the social encounters that are making with young men. No, it's a world of women here. Huh? The illustrations of um, uh, persuasion that you have on the right, um, though it's a recent illustration, there were no old illustrations we could find for this with my research assistant. But here is Mrs. Smith, and here is a figure visiting. And as I come to the end of my presentation, I, I look here at um, this moment when the confinement turns into something very different from Jane Austen, for, for Jane Austen. It turns into that moment when she's capable of drawing a moral topography by using the figure of Anne Elliot as a kind of echoing chamber or a place for the resonances of what happens to those who are left on the sidelines at a moment when you know history might enable some to become successful and to become dashing figures and wealthy figures in social life but that's not the story she's interested in she's interested in the story of someone who has second chances for a romantic experience but whose fate, in fact, for that adventure of romance and of a repositioning and of a social repositioning depends entirely on a capacity for imagination, intelligence, waiting, and patience. Hmm? The amazing thing is, I, here is a slide about laboring under constraints, but the amazing thing is that in her travel across the life of the figure of Anne Elliot, Jane Austen is able to create a romantic space of weddings, celebrations at the end, which, as you remember, she worked on very, very patiently and with, with great astuteness. But at the same time, she's able to create a space for reflection on what it means like, what it means to be a woman who is in need and in dire need actually of companionship, but not only the companionship of women friends, but in fact the companionship of a partner. So women, a woman seeking a partner, living a life of solitude and isolation, and at the same time, a woman who has in her own body felt the sufferings, the pain of losing her vitality, of losing her charm, of losing the red cheeks that were hers when she was young, the possibility for youthful infatuation until, until a figure comes back to her and that's the figure of Wentworth. And the way to do that depends, as we'll talk about a bit next time, depends entirely on Jane Austen's literary ingenuity. She has to use a new 
technique for literary writing called free indirect speech so that she can take us into the mind and the heart of her heroine.